All right. Well, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody, for inviting us. This is a lot of fun to talk about nature in the middle of New York City. Uh, as Eric said, I am from the outer boroughs, uh, the outer borough of the Bronx, to be specific. Uh, the New York Botanical Garden is a wonderful institution in the Bronx. We were established in 1891, uh, just north of the Bronx Zoo, a property of the Wildlife Conservation Society, um, and not too far away from where we are right now. The garden is a 250-acre National Historic Landmark landscape. It was designed to be a research uh, and educational institution, um, but its creation, its evolution, uh, really reflects a way of looking at the world that was prevalent in New York City uh, and really in the East in the late 19th century. Uh, the garden is built around a 50-acre old-growth forest. It is indeed the reason why the garden was established on its site in, uh, in 1895. Um, and I believe it's the thing that distinguishes it from all other great botanical gardens around the world. Truly a miraculous um, place, the forest in the middle of the garden. And there it is in the fall. Um, it really is quite beautiful. It is truly an old growth forest. Uh, we've done lots of research uh, over a long period of time and it's clear that the forest has been continuously forested since the glaciers receded and the tundra was replaced by uh, hemlock hardwoods and other cold tolerant trees. Why? How is it possible that this forest has been preserved for so long? It's really an accident of ownership um, and largely has to do with the foresight of um, the Lorillard family. The Lorillards lived on the site from 1792 to 1870. Uh, they had both their home and their factory there, their factory where they ground tobacco into snuff. Um, and they preserved the forest as a place for outdoor recreation, a really remarkable thing for the 18th century um, when they began there and it became more remarkable over time. Uh, not only did they preserve the forest, but they actively used the forest, uh, building carriage trails on what were likely old Native American roads and trails, um, all of which still can be seen there today. Uh, here's an image I was uh, seeing uh, Chris's presentation. It was great to see that Central Park was inspired by Hudson River School paintings. Um, this is a Hudson River School painting of the Bronx River and the forest at the garden. William Rickaby Miller from the 1850s. And in fact, being close to New York City and the artistic communities there, uh, the garden and its surrounding forests uh, was a very popular destination for painters. The transition from private estate to public um, uh, uh, resource uh, was one that began well before the garden was established as an institution. Um, those of you who are students of New York City uh, know who John Mullally was. Uh, he was a muckraking journalist. He was focused on politics um, and preservation, but he also, inspired by the su success of Central Park, um, lobbied everybody, anybody and everybody for years uh, to set aside land outside of the expanding city for more parkland. He recognized in the middle of the 19th century that Central Park wasn't going to be enough um, and helped get the New, Ar uh, New Parks Act passed in 1884, uh, which set aside 4,000 acres of parkland uh, north of the city, uh, north of Manhattan. Um, in the Bronx. Uh, it's, uh, it's New York City's Emerald Necklace, uh, Van Cortlandt Park, the Moshlu Parkway, uh, the Bronx Park, which is the Garden and the Zoo, um, and Pelham Bay Park. A remarkable thing that he lobbied hard to produce. And his writing was great. If you haven't read it, you should absolutely read this book. Uh, it flips back and forth between this very detailed kind of political polemic about how uh, creating parkland will, will save money and create and improve people's lives. And he cites examples in Europe and he cites Central Park. And then it's the most purple prose you've ever read about nature in the city. Um, everything was so sort of ecstatic as he wrote it. And he wrote uh, specifically about the site that was going to become the New York Botanical Garden, that this site would be perfect for establishing a, a, a botanical garden where children could profit from their very play, which is a great phrase. Um, and there is the site in the late 19th century. Uh, it was viewed as New York City's most beautiful um, and most intact natural area. Um, it was viewed so, of course, by the garden's founders, um, who made the active decision to preserve the forest uh, and the Bronx River and the heart of the garden as they set, aside, uh, set, apart, uh, uh, set out to design the garden and all of its programs and areas. The garden was founded by Nathaniel Britton and Elizabeth Gertrude Knight Britton, modeled after the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew. 
uh, to be a place where uh, all the plants of the world could be displayed and studied. Um, really an educational and research institution first and foremost, and only most recently an aesthetic uh, institution. Um, it was originally laid out by Calvert Vox just before he passed away, um, and his original layout set aside area in the heart of the garden for what was then called the Hemlock Grove, this 50-acre this native forest. The Hemlock Grove was preserved in uh, the John Brinley's general plan for the garden in 1896, again, preserved as a unique and important educational and conservation resource in the heart of the garden. Um, what a beautiful and stunning place outside of the city. Uh, it was celebrated again by Bronx River School painters, uh, by politicians, by journalists, by scientists. It was recognized for what it was 125 years ago, uh, unique and irreplaceable. 125 years have passed, and of course that hasn't changed at all. Because the garden and the forest is recognized as sort of the pinnacle, according to the then current notion of the climax forest, it was a hemlock forest largely, so it was felt to, be, it was felt to have reached the pinnacle of its ecological development. And so the garden's leaders, who were botanists, um, who were schooled in the Clemencian view of the climax forest, uh, believed that the absolute best thing to do for this unique and remarkable natural resource was to do nothing. Um, sort of a mother nature knows best approach, um, allow things to proceed into the future as they always have, and we will be doing right by this irreplaceable uh, natural resource. And that's great if things existed in a vacuum. And, and, and fortunately, the Clemencian view of ecology was debunked soon after it was published. Um, the contemporary views obviously accept and understand and celebrate that ecosystems are all about change over time and they have so many influences uh, that to try to keep them at one state would be uh, beyond impossible. It would be insanity. And the garden's botanists were slow um, to, to realize this, but ultimately came to realize this. The first hint that something was terribly wrong uh, was chestnut blight. It was discovered at the Bronx Zoo next door uh, in the very early 1900s. Um, uh, it was likely introduced on a shipment of Asian chestnuts that were planted in the area. Um, but by the time the presence of this fungus was brought to the attention of garden mycologists, uh, chestnut blight had already spread through basically all of the garden's chestnuts. The chestnuts, which had been a major part of the flora throughout the east, um, were gone in the matter of decades. In addition to this very, very horrible human disturbance, there were other uh, more insidious ones that still sort of seem cute uh, when you look at them, but it had no less of an impact on the health of the forest. We were a public landscape beginning in 1895. We invited people to the garden to learn and to study. And what happens when you let people off on their own is sometimes they misbehave. Here's a pile of, uh, I think it was 410 jacks in the pulpit, um, erisema, that were uh, confiscated from a school group leaving the garden after a visit in the middle of the day. And they were apparently confiscated by Elizabeth Gertrude Knight Britton, the wife of the garden's president, who was a early advocate for preserving wildflowers and apparently not, a, not someone to mess with. So uh, she, she got them all and, and they tried to replant them. But basically Jack in the Pulpit, which was abundant in the forest clearly, is now gone. Um, uh, other issues, this is Epigea repens. This is the plant that was cited in the document that said this landscape would be perfect for a garden because of wonderful wildflowers like this one, trailing Arbutus. Um, if you read the letter, it basically says um, we've done we're pulling our hair out because we have this great plant and nothing short of barbed wire fence will allow us to protect it from being destroyed by people walking through the forest and quote unquote loving and appreciating nature. Um, that's what happened. You have a public space. Um, you have a public space that was established in an area because of a unique natural resource. You invite people in to share that resource and they start destroying it. Um, and that's what happened at, at the forest. Uh, and it and, uh, didn't mean that it was eliminated. It meant that we had to look at the way we manage the forest differently. We couldn't just say that Mother Nature knew best. The genie was out of the lamp. Nature was no longer unspoiled in New York City, certainly, and of course now anywhere. 
Um, so one thing we tried to do is educate people and say, hey, listen, this is a unique and important natural resource. Um, you know, just please respect it. And again, those of you who work in public landscapes um, around the country and around the world know often that people feign not being able to read or not quite clearly understanding or believe that whatever you say to them was meant for everybody but them. Um, bird watchers often at the garden are the people who, who they, they, they love to understand the forest as a natural area but can't understand why they aren't allowed off the trail to pursue the birds into the far wild. Um, we also have natural impacts that are unnatural um, that, that, again, you wouldn't imagine. Uh, the, the population of squirrels in the forest is roughly 10 times greater than you would expect um, in an ecosystem of a similar size with a similar species composition. Um, so more or less, and even mast years, none of the oaks or hickories that really define the forest canopy um, can produce enough acorns or nuts to fully regenerate. So the forest is changing because of squirrels, which of course um, are so highly populated because we've killed most of the predators that take care of them. And then hemlock it's itse itself has been impacted by the hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, it was called the hemlock grove, the forest, in the 19th century. It was never entirely hemlocks. Hemlocks were at most about 25% of the basal area. Um, the forest was always oaks and hickories and chestnuts and other things as well. Um, but what hemlocks were there are basically gone, again, because of an insect that we humans introduced. Um, and if you look, we have great data about the forest because the garden was established by botanists who love to count and identify things. Um, so if you look now, the flora of the forest, the native flora, the natural flora, the spontaneous flora, is totally different than it was 100 years ago. It's totally different, all because of human influence. Again, the policy of let alone um, was, is proving to be a foolish policy. So what do you do? How do you preserve nature in the city? How do you protect the spirit of a place um, uh, without further uh, destroying it? Um, how do you intervene without becoming part of the problem? So that's what we're trying to figure out. The first step is to understand the resource. So we do regular uh, transects. Uh, it's about a 17% sample of the forest to establish uh, the sorts of vegetation that are growing, the trees, um, trees and shrubs largely, um, but a whole wide range of vegetation. That allows us to make our management decisions um, with information, and we can, we can judge our management decisions to see how well uh, they've, they've, how effective they've been. Regular inventories, uh, we know exactly what grows in the forest now, um, all 50 acres of it. Um, unfortunately, a lot of what grows in the forest are another important human disturbance, non-native species, uh, which often overwhelm and outcompete the native species in the forest and take valuable growing space, water, nutrients. How do you deal with those? This is what I call Bronx Gothic. Um, it was great to see Chris's <laughs> pictures. Um, the, the people, the, the forest is actually the easiest part of the New York Botanical Garden to inspire people to care about. There's something about nature that resonates with people in a city and maybe everywhere. Um, and so people will come and help. Uh, and what's great about them coming and helping is that they're learning uh, throughout the process and we hope becoming advocates of the forest, helping us preserve it into the future. Um, not all of it is so uh, you know, nice and clean and happy. Um, we've had to cut down about 800 cork trees. Uh, from throughout the 50-acre forest, some quite large, as you can see in this photograph. This is a tree. It's our fault that it's there. It was introduced into the garden's living collections in the early 20th century. It's the perfect invasive species. Fortunately, it was never widely grown. It's a big problem in Queens, I know. Um, but it's bird dispersed. It can grow in sun. It can grow in shade. It can go in wet and dry. And it just really took over the forest. So we've been removing them and chipping them and using the chips on our paths. Um, just cutting them down isn't enough. In order to keep the forest and healthy going forward, you have to make sure that what's regenerating is what you want there in the future. So what we found is when we cut down the, the, uh, the cork trees in the first go round, we had to have carpets of cork tree seedlings. These are just a carpet of seedlings. So you have to kind of keep at it. Um, and then what do you do once you've removed it? Uh, if you leave it, those of us who work in urban natural areas know nature abhors a garden, abhors a vacuum. Um, what will grow is generally what you don't want. So we plant uh, using plants grown from seed collected in the forest, hoping to fill that 
growing space and to reestablish a pattern of natural regeneration. What's been interesting is that here we are collecting you know, acorns or hickory nuts to try to at least keep a presence of those in the canopy. Uh, wherever we've planted these, um, for whatever reason, within a few years, tulip tree and sweet gum, which are two of the other native species in the forest, are regenerating more on their own. So we're having, you know, we're not necessarily picking the forest of the future. What we're trying to do is peel back the negative human influences that we've identified. Um, and planting again, we've planted uh, probably about 10,000 uh, seedlings and saplings throughout the forest, um, wherever uh, we've removed invasive species. Um, and it's had an effect. Um, I won't bore you with all the details, but basically by continuously monitoring the impacts of what we've done, uh, we've established that what we've created is, is different. It's still largely driven by the natural processes that drew the garden's founders to the place in the first place. Um, but we're seeing declines in most of the native uh, exotic plant species um, and it increases in some and we'll adapt our management going forward to deal with that. It's not just the plants. Um, the New York Botanical Garden is a research, a research institution, an educational institution. We want people to visit the forest. We want them to do so respectfully. Um, in order to give them the opportunity to come and experience this unique natural area, we have to make sure they have good access. So the forest trails, um, which have a long and tortured history themselves, were not particularly inviting um, for a very long time. Uh, you can see that hydrant, which is always the thing that kind of throws people off when they come to the forest. The hydrants were installed in the 1960s during a time when um, there are lots of fires, not all of them lightning set in the forest. So um, they're still there. We think of them as part of the, uh, you know, just like the soot on the rocks from air pollution. They're part of the sort of human uh, kind of sheen that goes over everything in the forest, but they don't really impact the health that much. When it rained, uh, the forests were impassable, so what would people do? They'd go around them, the, the, the paths were impassable, they'd go around them, they'd go into other parts, and, and they create problems. So working with Andrew Pogren Associates, we came up with a very simple and elegant way to restore the trails, to create access without impacting either the aesthetic or the natural balance of the ecosystem. And people have been flocking to it ever since. It's amazing when you spend a little bit of time explaining what is there. We have great signage. Um, when it seems like there is a there there, People really do come and take advantage of it, um, including literally tens of thousands of school children from the Bronx and elsewhere, uh, volunteers, docents, just people who want to see a bit of nature in the city. We also have a great revolving cast of researchers who are fascinated to learn a little bit more about nature uh, through the um, through the studying of all the living things growing, other than the plants growing in the, living in the forest. We have the healthiest populations of salamanders in New York City. Um, we have a lot of wonderful nature that you might not expect, including a fox uh, captured here and a great horned owl, both captured on camera traps that we've installed as part of a research project. Uh, a very vital and active living system. So here's a photograph, a photograph, a painting, another Hudson River School painting um, by Samuel Robertson Gifford, um, and a quote from the Olmsted brothers who did a master plan for the garden in 1924. The most notable natural feature of the botanical garden, perhaps as a matter of botany, and certainly as a matter of landscape, is the gorge of the Bronx River with its wild growth of hemlocks and associated plants, its picturesque precipitous slopes and ledges, its sense of remoteness and seclusion from the city and most of the works of men. Um, it really has always been celebrated as an incredible place. But what we know now is that there is no way to be remote from the works of men. There is no way to be remote from the city. We have to understand the impact of humans on the forest, on nature, and deal with it going forward so that we are partners in preserving this for future generations. Thank you. <laughs>